Morning, everybody. <laughs> All right, so you're awake. I'm sure those of you who know me are stunned to see me here at 9 a.m. As am I. I think RJ did this on purpose. <laughs> um, welcome to Heads of State. Uh, today we'll be joined by John Loba, president of BMG um, here in Nashville. He'll be in a little bit. First up, though, please welcome the uh, president and CEO of Alpha Media, Bob Prophet. Welcome, Bob. Sorry I don't have McCall in the way McVeigh did yesterday, but this is more on a budget than his was. McVeigh is a, <laughs> spends a little more money than I do. A six um, pack of PBR will work just fine. That's right, and it is 9 a.m. Um, Bob here is what we say, I guess, in the vernacular, a real radio guy. And uh, started with 15 years in Citadel. Last four years there, he was president COO, 209. Was named uh, president COO uh, of the then startup known as, now known as Alpha Media. He rose to president CEO in 2013. They operate 207 stations across 44 markets, mostly outside the, the top 50. And um, Alpha has 28 country stations and 10 classic country outlets led by KUPL in Portland. Um, fabulous you're here. Um, la when's the last time you were at CRS? I think 2014, so it's been a while. But and it's great to be here. But you got here a couple days ago. I did, and I, you know, the energy and the people and the connection, I think it's everybody's just ready for this. Uh, it's been a way too long, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, after the pandemic. So it's, it's, I think it's, it's great to be here. There's a lot of energy, a lot of good ideas, a lot of great people. Well, I think it's fabulous that all the CEOs of the major broadcast outlets are here this week. Um, take me through just kind of 30,000 foot maybe of, of where radio is today. Are we in as bad a shape as people think? No. Um, you know, there's a lot of critics out there. It happens all the time. We've had critics for years in the, in the radio business, and it's, it's still a great business. We made it through the pandemic. We had to change the way we did business. We modified how we, how we operate. We're changing uh, our operations in several of our markets as far as downsizing the physical plant and allowing people to work from home and, and having a modified work environment. I think, we, as you've seen, we're still the number one reach medium, and you can listen to Pittman and, and Bill Wilson, and you'll hear David talk about it, and Jenny and Caroline. Of, we all have the th same things to say. It's still a great business. It gets results for local advertisers. We're connected to our communities. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's got energy. There's some sexiness to it. We, we're fine. Are we as relevant in the lives of everyday Americans as we have been in the past? I, I think so. I think it all changed during the pandemic. We certainly have a lot of competition, uh, but we also have a lot of opportunity through digital. You can now stream us in the office, instead of if you had an AM station, you couldn't even hear it back in the day. Uh, so, I, you know, I think it depends on the marketplace, it depends on how much effort you put into your content, and it depends on how committed you are to your local communities. I, I think we're rev relevant, but I still think if, if we only reach 80% of the population compared to 90% or 97% 20 years ago, that's a big number, that's a lot of people, it's a lot of effect. What do we need to work on as a, as a business in radio? I think our, our people, it's talent. Re, you know, for us at Alpha, everything we think about is, is begins with our people and ends with our people. And our people being our listeners, our people can also be, uh, you know, the, the advertisers, but particularly the talent. We've got to retain, we've got to bring new talent in, we've got to get young people that want to be in the business and excited about it. We've got to continue to be creative and try new things and, and reach out to the community and be part of it in every market that we're in. Why should the people here be excited to be in radio in 2022, working more? And, and you know, we write in Country Air Chick daily, so-and-so has left the business to work outside radio. And you talk to people, and they're getting paid double the money to go work in, in something else that might not be their passion, but obviously you got to... You got to make a living. Um, that's 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 tough. So how do you get people to, to be excited about radio today? Bring them in a radio station. You know, when we used to go 
back with Citadel and, and, and with Alpha, when you go visit radio stations, and everybody out there that's awake and, and has done this knows if there's energy in a radio station or not. You know, do you feel good? Can you feel it in the halls? Is it exciting? Are people having fun? Are they high-fiving? We just got to get that excitement back. And, and I think it's still there when we bring people together. So bring them to the radio station, give them the tools to train them, have a modified work environment. We don't have to have the sellers coming in at 8 a.m. and checking back in at 5 and going back out. Um, and, and get the creativeness back into the business. Talk about Alpha Media in particular, um, just kind of the overall performance of, uh, of your 207 radio stations, how you're doing now, um, especially kind of numbers pre-COVID, like 2019 to now, of course, you went through a, a rough patch last year. Right. It's, well, we restructured the company, so, you know, you take the pandemic, you go into Chapter 11, and you try and come out the other side, and it, it's not easy, but we made it. We did well with it. I, we don't have to report our numbers like everybody else did yesterday, but I'd say we're right in the middle there, probably a little bit leaning towards the top, made our January budget by quite a bit, made February, so we're fighting back. You know, it was tough at, when your top four categories um, in automobile, restaurant, entertainment, and um, retail, are getting killed and hammered during the pandemic. But you, you know, you focus down, you get better at it, you try and help the community, um, you try and support your sales staff, you support your on-air staff, and you make it through it. And you gotta remember that the business also, there's still that barrier to entry. There's 10,000 radio stations. They don't make any more of them. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful business in, in the fact that you can grow it in different ways and different verticals, you have different categories we can talk to now. Employment is huge right now. Everybody's looking for people to work. They're spending money on radio. Gaming, if you're in the right market, you're, you're doing very, very well with it. So again, we, we tend to take the positive side to it and we feel very good about 2022. And what's the, the revenue split? Local, national, yeah. uh, digital, uh, maybe percentages on each and, and the trends on each? Yeah. Uh, well, radio revenue for us, all, all local revenue is about 80%, 82%. So when we compete in Portland with iHeart and, and Odyssey, we're number three in billing and national, but we're number one in local. So ours is boots on the ground, go out and see the local clients. So it's about 80, 82% local. And our digital has grown to the low teens as a percentage of our business. We're a little bit late into the game, but we've now spent money in infrastructure and, and, and really pumping the back end of it so that when a client does run a digital campaign, they're getting good results. Do I wish we had 700 people in Charlotte like Bill Wilson does at Town Square? What a model, we'll never have that. But we also have a local sales staff that has a connection with their, with their clients that can help them reach the goals that they need to, to move some product. Are you a, do you have um, digital specific salespeople or do your regular salespeople handle digital? We've tried to make that soup different, different ways. If, you know, we think everybody needs to be in the digital business and understand it. It's if all your clients are, everybody's talking about it. It's where budgets are going. Um, but we, we have a little bit of a hybrid. We have digital only regional uh, sellers, sales managers, and then we have each sales staff has a couple sellers that are very much focused on digital. Looking at a country specifically, how do your um, country stations perform versus the other formats uh, within Alpha? Uh, they do well, it depends on the market. Every market's a little different. You know, we used to tell, and, and, and when we've talked to investors in our board, it's 44 markets, 44 stories. And so in Portland, we battle it out with JJ, with the bull and, and the wolf, with Odyssey. And, you know, we win sometimes, they win sometimes. Right now, we're winning more than they are. Bobby Bones, we've done very well with them, bringing him in. Um, in Amarillo, or I'm sorry, in Lubbock, we're up against Town Square. And we, we do well there. And a couple other markets, we get beat. So it's still, you know, it's still the format that the sellers embrace, that the clients embrace. You know, the numbers are bouncing around a little bit, but it's a, it's a format that'll be around for a long, long time. Years ago here on a panel, I asked a, a person in your position, 
what kept them up at night. And their answer was this recurring nightmare that as they drove through town, all the auto dealerships were closed. <laughs> and you mentioned the problem with auto and restaurants and others, especially if you're, if you're really dependent on local advertising and if that's where you're, you're making your pitch. Um, kind of maybe dive into those a little more. Where are those revenue sources right now, those categories, and, and do you see them coming back soon? Not soon enough. Um, it used to be a 14 to 16 percent of our business, autos, uh, automobiles, and now it's six, seven percent. It's a big hit. Uh, but again, you take a good idea out to a car dealer, a remote works at a car dealer. You take any idea out there and they'll buy it. Now they're going to tell you right now we don't have any inventory because of the chip stories. Well, that's going to change. And they're going to say, well, what about the Tesla model? It's great because people come in, pay MRSP, order their car, and you know off they go in six months with their car. Well, that won't work for everybody. If you've got cars on your lot, you want to sell them. Is it scary? Yeah. Have we made it up in, in different areas? You bet. Do the ones that advertise and continue to try and grow their share during a time like this, will they have an, a benefit at the end that they, you know, as this thing gets fixed? They will. So is it scary? It's scary as hell when that kind of numbers are down. But you know, you've, you adapt, used cars, parts are big for us. Obviously people are working on their cars. So we've got triple, you know, double A auto or whoever the park store are in town or the or repair stores to come in and fix it. So it's, I don't think it's gonna last forever. Um, but I still also think that if you take a good idea out to a car dealer, they'll buy it. You mentioned you've got uh, about 38 country stations, 28 current and uh, current based and 10 classic country. What, um, what, what, in, within Alpha, tell me about just the way country fits. Well, we have 38 of them. We have format captains that help us with them. Our director of programming is a guy by the name of Phil Becker and um, country's not his forte. We don't have a captain or a corporate person for all of our markets, but in Portland, we use Becky Brenner to help us a little bit. So we, you know, we use a consultant here and there, but it depends on the marketplace. Um, you know, there are two country, as I said, two country formats in Lubbock. It's us in Town Square. There's two of us in Portland. It's who plays the best uh, talent between the records that's going to win, who does the most promotion, who, who gets out into the community. And I think when you have the CRS and you have, we've probably got six or seven people that are here that are learning new ideas. And, you know, it's a format that I think has heart and soul. And I wish it was the number one biller in Portland. It's not. Our news talk station is. And next to that's an AC. And every market is a classic rock that's third or fourth. And country, you know, needs to be in the top five. And we're not in Portland. We are in some other markets. It really depends. I know you measure market. Uh, revenues by market, but uh, any sense of what percentage of Alpha's revenue comes from your country stations? Yeah, it's about 15%. Is that about where you think it should be? No, I think it should be higher. I do. Uh, but again, you know, we have seven formats in one market, six mm -hmm. in another, so you have to balance that, that package for what's best for the for the advertiser, but I, I think it should be higher. I think country's on a little bit of a lull right now. Um, I wish the ratings were better in some markets, but I'm not too worried about that because Nielsen isn't the greatest. It's a little bit of a flawed system in my opinion. There's a thousand meters in Portland and uh, there's two and a half million people and I just don't think it's all indicative of how the listening really works, but that's my own personal opinion. And knowing that you're, um one of the original companies was called Live and Local. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to uh, ask just your, your thoughts on Live and Local, because you talked about people earlier and people in the hallways. Now most stations you go into, there's a cluster of five. There might be three people in the building. Yeah, not even, with us. Even before COVID. So what, yeah. where, where are you guys with that? Yeah, you know, we, we right at COVID, we did some reductions in force. What a weird word. Uh, we did some furloughs, but... You walk, again, I'll use Portland as an example. We've got more people, talent, um, in our building than our two competitors do. And we have one less radio station. We have six uh, stations and in, in Intercom and Odyssey and, and iHeart have seven. 
so, you know, we're doing more with less, but we're also doing a lot with the people that we've got. We do a lot of cross-sharing across the company. And, you know, it's like anything else, the best talent, we're going to pay them more, we're going to take care of them. But it's, it's I think the, the reports and the opinion that, that these radio stations don't have anybody in them, there's a little bit of that because of the pandemic. We let, definitely had jocks that were sitting on their couch doing their show during the first part of the pandemic, but talent likes to be around people, and, and it's a collaborative uh, effort, as, as Pittman said yesterday. Um, we got more people than people think. From the uh, CEO's chair, what kind of view or time spent thinking about it, uh, the radio and record relationship? It's been kind of a 70-year longer relationship, uh, Maybe not the same goals, but certainly uh, symbiotic. When one when one area goes up, the other seems to go up. What's your what's your sense of that? You know, I, I uh, my sense is that I'm I'm anxious to hear what John has to say about that. I uh, it's funny because as a general manager starting up through the ranks and starting in sales, you could tell with this voice I was never going to be on air. Um, it the the you know when you saw the PD and a record rep. They're sort of off on the side. The manager never got involved with this. Like, where are you guys going? What are you talking about? Where are you going to dinner tonight? What did you get from the guy? And um, I think it's a great relationship, and one's dependent upon the other. And has it changed? Is it evolving? Is there a whole bunch of data points? Absolutely. But there's also an art and a science. And the science are all the numbers we're looking at and the streaming numbers and the sales and you know, very good data that you've got, other than Nielsen in some cases, which would piss them off, but it's the truth. Uh, but the art, the art of it is Danny Dreyer, you know, talking to the people at Warner or John's guy and talking about a record and seeing some new talent. I think we need to take some more risks. I'm not a programmer. I hire really smart people to do that. I think just talking about, you know, just playing the same songs over and over, not trying new talent. We saw some new talent last night at the BMI uh, songwriter deal that Dan Spears did and brought us in. It's unbelievable talent. So should we be breaking some of those records? Should we be trying things, be a little bit riskier? Yeah, I'd like to see us do that more. Is there a, such a thing as a corporate philosophy or chat about that relationship? Or is it really no. local general manager and PD? And Are, where you hear about these radio companies that push down a lot, and this is the playbook, and this is what you do, we are absolutely the opposite. We hire really good market managers, really good ones. And we, they, they know, the guy, Lance Hawkins in San Antonio, knows San Antonio a hell of a lot better than I do. And he knows how, you know, he knows that market. Wish we had a country station in San Antonio, we don't. Uh, but no, there is no corporate mandate. Phil Becker keeps a pulse on it. Uh, the regional, you know, presidents keep a pulse on it. But it's what's what's working in Louisville is what's working in Louisville. It's probably not working in Portland. Phil did oversee a, and had a pretty good run at the country station in South Bend. Yes, so sir. he's got some experience he does there. Say that. Yeah. Um, hey, um, diversity is on the plate of every CEO mm -hmm. in America. Um, where is Alpha today in, uh, in pushing that forward? You know, we're, we, we talk about it. We've got a wonderful HR department. When we uh, run by a lady named Susan Arville, that really they're more than just filling out insurance forms and payroll. They're, you know, they're working on diversity training. Uh, we had a really, right after the George Floyd situation, Phil Becker again, put together a, a day of discussion on our urban stations and some of our talk stations and our top 40 stations. And we had Kamala Harris, we had Ebro, we had a ton of people come in and just let listeners talk about what, how they felt and how it was going. Um, we need to get better at it. We need to, you know, we need, we need to work on it all the time. Are we going to change the way we do business, you know, entirely? No. Are we cognizant? Are we aware of of diversity and how much import, you know more importance it is in a marketplace? Absolutely. What about personnel? What about the personnel inside Alpha in terms of diversity? How diverse are we? And is, is there a? I mean, 
Did you feel a need to install a, a, a new program, or you think you're... No, you're, I didn't. I, I think we've been, I, you know, we're in some black markets, urban markets, and in, in Columbia, South Carolina, we have the big DEM, and we talk to those, to, to our folks that, that work there. It's our number one biller in the market. It's the number one biller in, in our cluster. It's a great radio station, and, and we're aware of what's going on. You know, in Portland, we had nothing but, I mean, it's a crazy market that the, 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 the rioting and the touring up the downtown was crazy. And I can't tell you how many friends call me. It's like, what's going on in Portland? And our radio station's right down there in the middle of it in the Pac West Center with a chain leak fence around it. So I felt we were doing a, a good job, but do we need to be better, more aware, more thoughtful, you know, and, and think about it, discuss it, be open? Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Bob Profit, everybody. Thank you. We'll have a chance to chat a little bit more with Bob. Um, <clears throat> we're going to do about 20 minutes with uh, John Loba now. Come on up, John. And then we'll... Uh, <laughs> and then uh, we'll put the two of them together to kind of chat a little bit and take some of your questions. I believe there is a, the availability on the app for you to, uh, to do some questions. If not, we'll get RJ out there with a the mic. Um, as self-serving as this is going to sound, I invite everybody, if you've run that slide, to uh, grab a copy of the current Country Air Check print publication. Uh, we feature uh, Broken Bow's five years as part of BMG. We have a bunch of uh, uh, comments from John Loba and a number of his staffers there kind of outlining the differences uh, in the last five years. Uh, you know, in radio terms, I guess, Broken Bow went from locally owned and operated to uh, <laughs> to becoming part of a worldwide power, if you will. We did, uh, before we start, RJ asked that if anybody has any questions, submit them through the app, staff members. If there's something I haven't been asked, answering, you can put that in there as well. Also a caveat, I'm not a smart man, Lon, and it's evidenced by when RJ said, hey, is there any particular day you would like to do your panel or stay away from? And I said, whatever is best for CRB and CRS, I'm in forgetting that I had our show last night. So I'm going to sound even less smart this morning. <laughs> Great show. Um, and I forget your question. You feel a little <laughs> bit like the, uh, the canary that ate the cat after, uh, after you know, being part of BMG now? Yes, in a, in a spectacular way. You know, um, when we started the label essentially in, in 2001, we had absolutely zero leverage, not a lot of cash, and I always say, in some senses, because the label had, had been open a couple of years, we didn't just have a, we, just, we didn't have just no reputation, we had a bad reputation, sort of a clown show. So moving from that and having to struggle and fight for legitimacy in the first place um, was, was, felt monumental at the time. Luckily, we had a, a, a band of, of staff members, Lee Adams, Lena Bunt, Joe Jamie, Shelley, in the early days that were just as naive as me in thinking that we could make something work. And um, I remember very succinctly, I mean, because we were fighting not just for artists, but for the label. And we had a song by Craig Morgan. It was going to be um, our first real hit. It's what I love about Sunday. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, almost home. And um, everybody we talked to, because we all had relationships from previous labels, <clears throat> and Craig had a relationship uh, as well with, with radio after being in Atlantic. And everybody said they loved Craig, they loved the song, they loved us. But it kept coming back, because there was a lot of consolidation going on in the industry at the time, kept coming back that, well, we just don't know if you're going to be around in six months. And there was a Friday afternoon where I was so damn frustrated. We had, I think, one ad on the board. We probably were teetering on having a bullet. And um, I'm sitting there, and, and everybody's commentary to me, we love you, we love Craig, we love the song, don't know if you're going to be around. And uh, I'm usually pretty diplomatic. I probably would have had a career in politics as an ambassador. I don't like to piss people off too much. And, uh, but I'm sitting there and we were fighting for our survival. And I wrote an email that basically said, 
if you think you know who you're doing business with in the next six months, think again. And I listed all of the imprints who had closed. And then I said, and with the rumored Sony consolidation, you don't know who you're going to do business with. So I ask again, are you going to play the right song, the best song from the best artist, or are you gonna worry about who's around six months from now? And I sat there and I looked at it and I'm like, uh, should I send this or not, should I send it? And we had staff around me and they were all cheering me on to send it and I closed my eyes and pressed send. And uh, the next, that Monday, I think we had 11 or 12 ads. We were up 20 some spins that gave us life and we had our first top five record. So I say all that to say, that's where we started. So when BMG acquired us, we by then had, had, had gained some leverage, had some more money to operate with, but we still always felt a little bit like that, that, that second class citizen. And BMG coming in with their global uh, network, you know, we're part of a major media company, Bertelsmann, that has RTL, largest television network in Europe. We have Random Penguin House books, Fremantle Entertainment that's Idol and X Factor. So to finally have kind of that global reach and that legitimacy um, was, was just so absolutely invigorating. We sort of felt like for the first time, okay, we're on the same stage as Warner and Sony and Universal. Um, with that came all of the corporate uh, reporting and luckily we don't have, uh, have to report, we're, we're privately held, so that is such a, an advantage. But um, a whole complexity of, of, of corporate issues that you usually don't have. But on balance, such an amazing time for us. Let's take it down from 30,000 feet to the street. And uh, what are the revenue streams uh, and maybe the percentages of each at a, at a record label today to use that old school term? Well, I won't get in exactly to percentages, and it differs from label to label, but certainly um, streaming revenue is what's driving us, and even more so through pandemic, because like all supply chains, the physical supply chain uh, has problems and is choked, which is especially frustrating because we're seeing the adoption of vinyl by the country consumer, and there we could be generating a significant amount of revenue, and even in CDs still, uh, if those supply chain issues weren't there, Right now, uh, we're six to eight months out on a vinyl, so that takes a lot of planning. So you're seeing a digital release, and then you're seeing followed that by a, a physical release. So streaming's a big part. 360 uh, deals um, produce some revenue. Jason Aldean was the last uh, uh, deal we did that, that didn't have a 360. He came in right under the wire. Uh, that would have changed our P&Ls a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> you think, uh, <laughs> you know, um, so those are those are the primary revenue streams. Um, I'm surprised you're about physical. I mean, it's, it's coming back. What percentage of it? And is it is it really worth pursuing? It, it absolutely is, because it's especially with vinyl. It's a high margin. It's a very high margin. And for that super fan, you know, I, I know in looking at our uh, at our CHR and, and urban divisions and, and you've seen Taylor do it you can repackage the same release three different ways. You can have three different colors of artwork on a vinyl or even a CD, and that super fan will go out and purchase every one of those. So it is, it is, it is sort of the icing on the cake. You know, it's not what is, is keeping us in business, but there's a lot to be realized, and with that continued adoption of vinyl, it's a great margin, and a lot of times it's a one-way one shipment, so you're not gonna get any returns. I guess we've been, or you guys have been doing 360 deals, what, 15 years or so, right in yeah, there? roughly. Um, how has it changed? How has it worked out? Has it made the artist more your partner? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, in the beginning, there was so much resistance to it, obviously, um, but it was, it was strictly a matter of survival without uh, the significance of streaming we and, had. And maybe to. define that a second. We're assuming people, every, everybody knows what a 360 is. Gotcha. Yeah, you're essentially, um, and, and there's, it's split different ways, but essentially the record label participates in 
multiple revenue streams in an artist's career, primarily touring, but merch. Some include sponsorships. Some include any uh, media appearances. Now with NFT out there, some have that. It gets diced a million ways. Um, and originally, there, like I said, there was so much resistance, but as, as managers and artists learned, that just makes us invested in more parts of your career. It allows uh, the label to take a more holistic view. So if you look strictly on the recorded revenue side of the equation, there's some spends that just wouldn't necessarily make sense. But when you say this will help drive touring, this will help drive a sponsorship opportunity, you're, you're making a more holistic choice for that artist. You're allowing for a bigger spend for that artist. And um, no deal is exactly the same. They, they, they fluctuate depending on the artist and where they're at in their career, what the environment is. But the whole idea is if we're going to be in this, we're going to be in this together, especially if you're, you're starting from ground zero and, and really building that career together. The new breed of artists, any resistance to this at all? No, no. The, I, I find the new breed of artists are so much more forward thinking. They want you deep in that business. Um, and they, and they um, in some senses, they're, they are more impatient with their careers. Some senses more patient. It's interesting. Um, you know, we can talk more about it later, you probably ask, but when you look at radio specifically, it used to be artists, I mean, the first question was, when is my radio ad date? When are we going to radio? And, and, and that's all they could think about. Now the younger artists on balance uh, understand consumption, understand that for the most part, you don't go to radio until you have a story to tell, a consumption story to tell. So they are more patient in getting to radio. I don't know whether that's good or bad, um, but they are. They're thinking about those other forms of their business, thinking about live even more, thinking about streaming even more. Um, they are more holistic, so they, I think, understand that 360 element more. And we will get to radio in a second, but I'm, I'm curious, with all the avenues open today to artists to get their music exposed, so many so many more than ever. Um, why does an artist even want to sign a record deal? And, and do they have to? And if I yeah. came to you and, or if you pursued me, right. if I was a big TikTok artist or something going on, right. and you want to do a, and you want, yeah, that's it, can I, I it can happen. Realize how humorous that lot. is. <laughs> um, but seriously, what, uh, what, what's the pitch? Why should I go with a label and yeah. do that 360 deal? Why? But well, I will say I've hear, I hear uh, from people who work on that streaming side with artists that their goal is to get a record deal. They want a major label deal. Without a doubt, without a doubt. And I think, number one, we're in a fortunate enough position now that we have enough incoming that we don't have to go chase. And especially with uh, those unsigned artists that, um, that aren't in general asking for a record deal, when you try to chase them, it's just not, it's, it's not going to happen for the most part. Um, Jelly Roll, who, who we have signed, is an exception to that. We, we're very active in that. But um, I think, number one, the artist has to recognize, I need a record label. And it usually happens when they're having a fair amount of consumption, they're selling a fair amount of tickets, but they hit a ceiling. And it, and it usually is driven around touring. They can do 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 seats at a time, but then they plateau, and then they start bumping their head against that ceiling and realize, I need more. And that's where the label comes in. Um, number one, first and foremost, that is where radio adds the rocket fuel to that career. Um, it is mass appeal, it is mass distribution, so they do get that. But also with the, with the streaming companies, you know, we have relationships. We're engaged every day. We can tell their story. 
I think um, it, it gives them confidence that their music, much like radio, is being represented, getting their day in court instead of a spray and pray and, and hope. Um, beyond that, you know, labels have had to evolve and become much more savvy um, in, with socials, with marketing in general. It used to be radio, radio, radio. Now they see all these other areas and some are very good at it without labels. Many aren't, few are good across the spectrum of the variables into their careers. From the moment that radio moved away from Fibber McGee and Molly, look it up, yeah. and, I, and I wasn't yeah, explain there. Explain that to me. <laughs> uh, um, radio has been tremendously a huge part of a record company's marketing efforts. Certainly it's changing, you just touched on it a little bit, but go down a little bit more just on your company's philosophy uh, going forward here and the ra relationship with radio. Sure. Uh, number one, I grew up in radio promotion, so I have a heart and an affinity for it um, without question. You see the power of it. And um, I know with, with consolidation, um, you know, there are many discussions in this town about thinning the promotion rep ranks or reassigning those reps because of the consolidation of decision-making power at the top. But we at, at BMG are, are absolutely not doing that. We're going in the other direction of placing more emphasis there. And I'll, and I'll tell you why it goes even beyond country. When we were acquired by BMG, we were the only entity that had a radio promotion staff. Our top 40, our urban, Hot AC divisions did not have a radio promotion team because our company had a restart and it was very digitally driven. And uh, I'm not sure that the CEO saw the value in it initially. After seeing what we do at any point in time, we have 18 of the top 20 streaming tracks globally for BMG. And I, from day one, have been waving radio's flag and the power of radio. and. Um, a, a, about three months ago, four months ago in New York, I did a presentation. It wasn't in country, but it was for Hot AC and CHR and showed essentially from 20 to 15, 15 to 10, 10 to 5, 5 to 1, and then the week after a song had gone number one, at every one of those waypoints, your streams doubled. So the magnification of that, you have one real hit in those genres, and the promotion team is, uh, is, is paid for. So I'm not gonna break any news here, but let's just say BMG's other genres now are going to be leaning more into radio. And then specifically on the countryside, um, even if we, and I could be completely wrong, but I don't think so. Even if, let's say there are, are five individuals making decision for all of country radio and programming, what does everybody else do? You, we're, you're talking about revenue, Bob, and I, I, I say to the staff all the time, I say, you know how we win the ties? We figure out how to help drive revenue for that station. You know, I know there's always talks, oh, we don't want our artists use or this and that. It's not that. If we're, if we're driving revenue, we're probably driving exposure in one form or fashion. So our reps, we talk about all the time, become marketing executives in that market, you know, go to the general sales manager. Even if the decisions aren't being, being made at the local level, go to the general sales manager and say, what can we put together to help drive revenue for you and make my artist more aware in that town? So um, it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out, but at the end of the day, it's telling a story, it's a narrative, and connecting with those in that local community. I really believe that, so we invest in radio. So you're seeing streams double at those benchmarks. Yes, and in, in Hot AC and in, um, in CHR. I haven't done it for country, but I'm sure it's probably even more skewed that way. What, um, where is streaming in, in revenue uh, as, as part of your business model? Is it, is it oh, it's, you know, people have complained for a long time that they're, they're, they're underpaid. Songwriters are underpaid from streaming, from digital right. uh, royalties. Right. Where is streaming in, in the As a percentage label? of our overall, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, I'll just say it's a, a, a substantial. I mean, you're, you're north of 70-ish of there. 
which is also great because it allows um, those younger artists actually time to develop. They can survive for a while. When our advances run out, that streaming revenue, you know, and might not be significant, but they can pay the bills, they can refine their artistry, dial in more to their brand. It allows them to be much more experimental with music. You know, you look at Jimmy Allen, and we were releasing a song a month. We still had the main body of work, but we were releasing a song a month to create that connection with the consumer, to find out what was, what was um, really working for him. And, um, and he was making a little money in the process. We'll get more into this uh, radio record relationship in a second when we get both you guys together. Um, I asked Bob earlier about diversity within Alpha. Um, I look at BBR, and I think I see a leader in Nashville in terms of diversity. Uh, you want to kind of take us through kind of where you guys are? Thank you. Um, if you say anything about us, that's the thing I think I'm most proud of. When we were acquired, um, you know, Benny, our previous owner, had a very specific vision for artists, and, and it was his money, and it worked, by the way, he, but he was really solo, male-focused, and, and we had just a few producers that we worked with, and the first thing I wanted to do um, was, was diversify. Diversify revenue away from Jason Aldean, but diversify the roster as well. And um, I wanted to show that country music really is a big tent. If you give the consumers some choices, they will, they will the, the music still has to be there, the artistry still has to be there, but they can connect. And then by doing that as well, Jimmy talks all the time, he says, you know, my biggest goal is that kids growing up that look like me, that were in similar situations, and Blanco says the same thing. And now Brooke Eden says the same thing, that they see somebody on that stage that they can identify with, that they can feel welcomed by, and say, hey, there is a place for me in this genre. So um, I wanted to, you know, when you think about legacy, I wanted that to be ours, that we didn't just talk the talk, but walk the walk. And part of that, had to be, you know, to prove that it was commercially successful as well. It wasn't just the right thing to do, it was the right financial thing to do. And luckily that's, you know, that's proven out. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm super proud of that and uh, we're going to keep pushing in that, in that arena. John Loba. Yeah. All right, the two guys together. Um, certainly uh, over the last few years, both industries have changed tremendously. And, and I'd like to focus a little bit about um, on that radio and record relationship because it is so important. I think we've really seen it in the ratings. Uh, you know, we ran a, the last couple of weeks in Country Art Check, we ran some ratings. And the bad news is since PPM started, we just measured the top 50 markets, but since PPM started, it looks like a mountain. And the, and the mountain top was a few years ago. It's really, we're now at historic lows uh, in country. Um, as we try to come out of this, probably stronger to come out together, because I think one of the things that we certainly see in country ratings is that during the pandemic, we see what impact lack of concerts, what impact lack of artists coming through your radio stations have on that audience. Because um, it's, it's part of the excitement of country radio, uh, these artists. So Bob, you, you heard what John had to say. Going forward, if you want to create opportunities, what are some of the things you think, places that you heard maybe him talk about, especially if he's gonna double down his efforts with radio, you wanna come on in. We'd like to see you replace some of that restaurant and <laughs> you know, other revenue by getting your national revenue up, by getting your ratings up, maybe with their help. Yeah, uh, I would just echo what, what John said about what, working with the, a little bit more diverse into the system of the radio station. So the sales manager, how can we help you? How can we work together? How can we make this 360 that works so well for the artists nationally? How can we do some of that locally? Are there things that we can do uh, to, to help both build the brand and, and, and build revenue for the radio stations? We have that live performance lounge in Portland that is, you know, it's pretty legendary. When you talk to people that have been there and it seats about 120 people and artists love it because it's right on the first floor of the Pac West building. Had some windows knocked out during the riots, but we didn't. But 
um, uh, homeless, you know, camped out in front of them. But, uh, you know, so we're, we, I, I welcome that. I think that, you know, the connection that you can have and, and the meet and greets with the audience. I mean, for a while it was like nobody's ever going to do a meet and greet because of the pandemic. And that's sort of getting past. We're getting through that and getting to the other side. So I welcome it and look forward to it in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, to the point about your studio, too, and the investment and the connection with the audience, um, we specifically many times would go to Portland early in a radio tour because we knew there was amazing content that was shot there and that would be posted and really represented who that artist was. You know, the, some of those lounges and stuff you go into are less than stellar and there's budgetary reasons and, and everything, but you guys made the investment, and as a result you got more from us. We wanted to partner more. We wanted to do more. So it's, it's, it's a great example. And then, again, if, even if decision-making power is not in that market, radio is still that personal connection that you talk about and creates that excitement and, and, and generates ticket sales and, and on and on and on. So I can't see uh, why you would, would de-emphasize that relationship from a, from a record label standpoint um, and instead do that outreach because even you take the radio station away it's like okay who can we talk to okay club owner can we do a promotion there is there an indie newspaper in town cool but it doesn't have the effect of radio so selfishly that's why we want to keep driving um, that relationship and, and paying attention to it for the bulk of my life radio has been about music discovery Seems to be less now. Is radio now seen by labels as just as the closer? You get that story built up and then... Uh, um, I, I am so passionate about this. And, and when I got in the business um, in 95 or 96, it's, it's interesting to see the evolution. It was all about research, research, research. And I remember my uh, mentors talking about, we've got to convince stations that record sales matter, the album sales matter. And over time and through CRS, honestly, and, and panels, that education process took place and more emphasis was placed on what those sales matters. And then we went to the digital world and single sales, you know, we gotta pay attention to that, gotta pay attention. And radio came along and started putting that in their decision-making process with, um, with their research. Then fast forward with streaming, everybody was, you know, a lot of people were discounting it at first, and now there is so much import placed on that, that like everything, I think there's that, that tipping point. And I'm a finance guy, so data matters to me. So much of what we built with BBR was based on data and being able to tell that narrative and what was really going on. So I love it, and it's great that we have all of this, um, all of this information uh, at our fingertips and to help inform decisions. All that being said, I think we've gone extreme the other way. Yes, we can tell if there's a connection through streaming, but also radio is, does have that power to set the agenda, to say something's important, to create that excitement. And it, maybe it doesn't show up immediately on streaming. And by the way, we're we're going through the same thing at streaming now. Well, where are we on the, on the playlist? Are we down at number 32? Well, what kind of flip and read can you get on that? Because how many people listen to number 32? You know, when we get top 10, let's start talking about what's really happening with that record. So I say all that to say, I just, I hope and wish that it, we tip back a little bit more and radio says, you know what, we have the power to say what's important and to take chances, maybe not on every record, every artist, but when we're passionate, we're going to play it enough to get a real read, to see if streams are driven, to see if there's research. Um, to me, that's my one criticism of radio is you're giving away that power to set the agenda. Bob, I certainly realize that uh, breaking music isn't the top usually of a CEO's uh, to-do list every day, but what's your sense of, of radio today? Because um, you, you're, like I said, a radio guy at the start. Uh, what's your sense of radio's role in in music today, whether it be discovery or bringing it home? We, we uh, that's a, man, it's a tough and a great question. We, you know, we need to be cognizant 
of what's going on with, with new music. We need to get egos out of the way oftentimes where it's not just one APD or, or music director that's listening to it and say, I solely alone have decided whether or not this is a song to play or not. I think we got to go back to what the basics of the, the art of the business and the art of, you know, we can make this happen. We do like this. There is a connection here. We did do an artist studio visit at our, at our live performance lounge or in a conference room in, you know, Lincoln, Nebraska. I think that, I think it's just got to be as much a collaboration as possible. And as we had this big two year pause with the pandemic, we got to remember that's going to be passed. It's not, yeah, if things change, yeah. If they change forever, if they change for the good, I don't know. But we're getting back to normal, and normal is people connecting and talking and thinking and communicating and brainstorming. So I, I, I welcome anything that we can do with the record companies to help us. We uh, survived eight tracks in the car. We survived cassettes. We survived the CD player. You heard John talk about the 70% revenues from streaming. Are we going to survive streaming in the car? Yeah, I mean, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I have no idea what it's going to look like. I think we will. If you, you know, you, you, when, when we're talking to financial folks and you're in New York and you're sitting in some 28-year-old MBA's office and he goes, well, isn't radio just like an ice cube? Isn't it not when? It's, you know, it's, it's not if, it's a matter of when. It's like, who are you listening to in New York? You're streaming all the time. You know, go to Topeka, Kansas. Go to Mason City, Iowa, you know. Go to Lubbock, Texas. It's a little bit different out there. People are driving around. Yeah, they like streaming, but as Pittman says, and he's eloquent at it, it's your, you know, it's your listening, you know, app. It's it's what you want to listen to get away. Radio connects you. We talk about the artists. You know, you talk about what's going on. There's a, you talk about what that means in Portland, or San Jose, or wherever it happens to be. So, uh, I think we'll yeah, we're gonna survive it. If we can survive what just happened in the last two years, we'll survive it. So we'll end on this. Does the 22-year-old uh, Bob Prophet get into radio today? Yeah, you know, he would. Because uh, first of all, he doesn't know anything else to do. I was never good at anything else. I was a shitty student. But as I walked in that, uh, down the hallway here, and I saw the Hall of Fame, and I saw three of my mentors up there, Mike Lynch, Mike Oatman, and Larry Wilson. And when I was 22, I was working for Mike Lynch and Mike Oatman in Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> Uh, at a country station, yeah, I get into it. It's a fun business. It's so people oriented. The people that you see out in the, out in these halls, the energy that we have. We have our director of sales here from Portland. We have one of our top sellers, Gina Atkinson. I love this business, and it's still a good business. And the critics, be a critic. That's fine. We're going to focus on the possibilities and, and what's good and 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 what we can do that's good in the community, and we're going to be fine. Yeah, I get in it. And in 30 seconds, does the 22-year-old uh, John Loba get in the music business today? 100%. I remember uh, when I started six months in, I was in elevator with Jim Ed Norman and Eddie Reeves at Warner Brothers, and I was going on and on about what had happened over the last two weeks. And Eddie said, that's why we hire young kids like you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, to remind us how great this business is. And I said, you have to be reminded how amazing this business is? He said, give it 10 years, kid. You'll change your mind. <laughs> he gets off on the second floor, and Jim Ed and I went to the third floor, and he said, don't listen to him. If you love people, and you love music, and you love being a memory marker, you will love this job every day of your life. And I still get up every morning and think about that and think this business is greater than ever. So, so blessed. Please thank John Loba and Bob Prophet.